Okay, so um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, so Jack and I will be giving a talk about um, the short story, The Library of Babel. Right, so which is by Jorge Luis Borges, although I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it because unfortunately neither of us take Spanish, so cute. So forgive us if we completely butcher the name. Um, like was implied, it was originally in Spanish, and if you're unaware of the premise or simply want to brush up because you read it a while ago, well, I'll give you some time actually right now to skim the short story or read the summary, which is on the next slide, right? And after that, we're going to start talking about some ways you can look at the idea of meaning and truth um, and apply it to the library, although it's a very superficial skim of epistemology, really. And then we'll also talk about a bunch of miscellaneous observations, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And unfortunately, this was planned to be a discussion, but it's a little bit limited in the fact that we can only use the Q&A feature for that. So, OK, so right now, hopefully you can all, um, oh, that's a good idea. You can all uh, read the summary or maybe skim the short story. Um, and I will uh, send the link in the chat um, in case you want to take a look. But we will also give a that did not copy correctly. Uh, you can do it. Jack, Jack and Rupert. Yeah. Um, it's Borges. Borges. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, just wanted you to know. Here, I got it, Rupert. It's okay. Thanks. Yeah. Oops. Uh, Technology, I'm such a boomer. Here we go. Um, okay, so the link is in the chat in case you wanna um, take a look. We'll give a few minutes for you to read. Um, and there's a uh, plot summary, but basically it's a um, library that contains every permutation of uh, characters um, all, well, I think it's uh, like 26 um, letters and then two punctuation, the comma, and the period. And um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. But for now, just the idea is just that there's a bunch of possible books. It's a huge hexagonal library. People decide what to do with their lives. That's pretty much it so far. But...
Um, just to get an idea of where everybody is, uh, could you um, raise your hand if you need more time? Can they do that? I don't think they can do that. Oh, yeah. oh they can. Okay, great. Okay, well then maybe we should give like half a minute, maybe a minute more, um, because it looks like most people are are done. Um, so yeah, a minute or so. Are we all good, do you think? I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, yeah. OK, so in case you didn't read it or fell asleep, it's very simple. It's just you have a bunch of books all full of random characters and arranged in a giant hexagonal library. People don't. People think it's random. Some people try to find this, this book that tells you everything about the universe. That's pretty much it. OK. Next slide. Okay, so one of the easy thing, questions you can ask before we kind of dive into some of the more philosophical implications, you can just ask how many books are there. And I'm sure a lot of you probably reached your calculators already to calculate this. But if you'll allow us to save you the trouble, there's 25 characters, as Rupert mentioned, there's 22 alphabetical characters followed by a period, comma, and space. If you're wondering why it's 22 characters, I believe it's because the original was written in Spanish. And I'm, again, I neither of us know Spanish, but I believe you can reduce it to 22 characters in the alphabet, I believe. And then all you have to do is raise the possible number of characters for each, or the possible choices for each character in each book. And it's up to the power of how many books, uh, how many characters there are in a single book. And then you get this really big number that's basically something with um, one to two million zeros. So obviously there's a lot of books. So doesn't answer the question of whether it's infinite or not, but just in case you were curious. There's also um, some analogs you might consider. Obviously the fact that the library is this physical space is um, introduces its own aspect, but some of the um, similar thought experiments that you can think about are, I'm sure we've all heard of how if given infinite time, a monkey on a typewriter typing randomly will eventually produce Hamlet just kind of the same idea as being able to randomly produce relevant information as the kind of God book in the library. It's also kind of similar to normal numbers. Normal number is kind of quite ironic because almost because you don't know many numbers that are actually like this. But the idea is simply the idea of a number whose decimal includes all possible sequences. Um, honestly, this isn't super relevant, but it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Maybe you've seen that little you know, graphic underneath there that claims that pi includes all sequences. It doesn't, okay? We don't, I mean, we don't know if it does or not. If we don't know that pi is normal, okay, so that's actually wrong. But okay, sorry. Anyway, and then for spot experiment that you can use to compare to library Babel, which is basically the same as the idea of a normal number is called Quine's reduction, or Quine's reduction, pardon me. Quine was this analytical philosopher was really important, but he, he reasoned that any, all of the random, interest generated by the idea of random sequences can even be reduced even more from 25 characters to simple zeros and ones and which creates a infinitely long binary string that includes all possible substrings right that's just, that's just because i hate that so much sorry okay now, if we want to ask, so obviously not all of the books appear to have a meaning because a lot of them just appear as random, um, random sequences of letters. But if you read it um, carefully, there's a part in the, um, the story where the narrator 
um, makes a claim that everything does have meaning because there's a way to interpret each um, seemingly random sequence as meaningful in a sense. So the question that is presented to us is now, how do we actually figure out what does have meaning? Which, which, and how do we figure out which path where meaning comes from? And there's a lot of different theories on this and we're only gonna present two. And I wanna reiterate that we're really skimming the surface here. But this is one where it's actually pretty straightforward in its application to the library of Babel. It's the idea of pragmatics, which is actually different from pragmatism, 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 kind of tricky, but it's kind of, it's probably the same thing. Um, the principle I wanna, wanna focus on here is the idea of intention-based semantics, which is really just the kind of intuitive notion that the meaning of something relies on the intentions of the person speaking it. Um, one of the kind of pioneers of this idea was a man named Paul Grice, who distinguished between sentence meaning and utterer or speaker, what we call now speaker meaning. Sentence meaning, like if I say, sentence meaning is the literal meaning of a sentence that is conveyed without any context. So if I like say, there is a murder behind me, what I mean is that in the spatial area directly behind me, there exists a murderer. And then there's also the utter speaker meaning, which is basically the idea that someone always says something with an intention. So if I say there's a murder behind me, the utterer meaning is you should probably call 911. Um, Paul Grice came up with this precise definition that's kind of interesting, um, but it basically captures the idea that S or when someone speaker S means something or P by saying X is because they're trying to convince their audience in believing P and they're trying to make them trying to make their audience aware of this effort to convince them. And then if you try to apply this to the library of Babel, then what happens is that a lot of you can you can argue that unless there's some, I guess, God that creates the entire library, although that's actually not um, a theory that's really presented in the work, you can argue that most of the stuff really doesn't have meaning because there's it's random and there's no intention behind it. Therefore, I should make the important distinction that Paul Grice, he, he distinguished between the two meanings, but the more um, significant idea was that utter speaker meaning is more important than sentence meaning. So if we subscribe to that kind of logic, then most of the content in the library is meaningless because it simply doesn't have speaker meaning because it simply doesn't really have a speaker. Okay, and again, there's a lot of different views on where meaning derives from, but one that's pretty stark in opposition to the idea of pragmatics is the idea of, a truth, con of truth conditional semantics, which basically says that you can define meaning from, of a sentence um, by evaluating its parts and, whether, and evaluating which conditions under which the sentence is true. For example, um, this was part of the ideas of, I think, Tarski and um, Donald Davidson, which is the idea that, um, and the, the main idea is that if I say something like snow is white, then you can extract the meaning from it by considering the condition that is true that snow is white. And that sounds trivial, but the idea, but the basic idea behind it is that in some ways it ignores context and you can evaluate a statement simply based off of whether it states something true or not. Um, and if you apply this to the, library, to the library of Apple, then it more closely resembles what the narrator, maybe not perfectly, but more closely resembles what the narrator believes in the library that you can simply interpret a statement and in terms of whether it has true or false conditions. Um, okay, so for more observations that don't really fall in the under specific category. Obviously, if you want to ask about what the, the, the name the Library of Babel refers to, it's a reference to the biblical myth of the Tower of Babel. Um, can't say I've really read it. Have you, have you um, Rupert? Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Um, I mean, sure. Basically, it's uh, the people have like a great idea to reach heaven by building a tall tower and um, and uh, God like um, looks down on their hubris and then makes each of them speak different languages so that they can't communicate with each other. And so they can't like fulfill their arrogance, I guess. Um, so, yeah. And obviously there's 
um, quite a bit of a comparison you can make between the what people are trying to look for in the God book and comparing it to the, the futility of being able to reach God in the Tower of Babel, especially because the reason it's made so impossible is because there are so many different ways you can interpret books, similar to how there are so many different languages that the workers can't figure out how to build the tower anymore. Um, on the idea of existing, kind, well, no, not really, but it, um, independently, it, the story also kind of pokes fun at certain um, schools of thoughts. One of them, it claims how idealists, um, it's like in the first page, believe that a triangular or a square um, room is impossible, which is poking, well, which is reflective of the, um, the actual school of idealism, which is basically that reality is based on ideas. So because idealists have not seen a triangle, tri triangular or square room, it simply can't be a part of their mental conception of what space. Also then pretty much in the same sentence, pokes funds at mysticism, which is basically just mystics trying to gain knowledge through visions they call ecstasies. And it kind of um, criticizes the futility of that endeavor. Um, if, I, if I can just jump in to add something about language. Um, if any of you have the uh, short story actually open, at the end of page three to maybe like top third of page four, um, there's a really, uh, there's a passage that I think makes it very clear that um, the, the comparison between the Tower of Babel and like language and such, um, it's basically uh, someone finds a book um, that contains peculiar lines. And um, if, I, if I can just uh, read, read a sentence, um, within a century, the language uh, of the lines was established. A Samoyedic Lithuanian dialect of Guarani. Um, I apologize if I butcher any of those pronunciations, uh, which I, I'm sure I did. But um, basically, it's there are so many ways to interpret something. You could look at all of the human languages and which way is the, the right way to do so. All right. So. Um, now getting back into maybe more concentrated ideas. Um, so if we d d have figured out a way to distinguish what we think is meaningful and what we think is gibberish, the question now becomes, or I guess the grammatically gibberish, the question now becomes how do we separate truth from logical gibberish? And again, there's a lot of theories, and we only cover two of them here. One of them, actually three, one of them is um, correspondence theory, which is the idea that a belief is true if and only if it reflects some kind of part of reality. So if I say, my, if my belief is fire trucks are red, it's true because in reality, something, something that's a fire truck is actually red. But it's not, it's not kind of seems to be the um, view of truth in, within the short story for everyone looking for the supposed God book is trying to find something that reflects reality in its, or that accurately reflects reality and that they can therefore use. Um, one of the criticisms, because maybe this seems like a very solid and maybe obvious definition of truth to you, but one of the criticisms of the correspondence theory of truth is that in order to say, if you, if you want to be able to say what, whether something is true or not, then you have to propose an idea for how the reality works to you which may be obje probably objective or maybe it's subjective experience like idealism. Um, but in order to justify what your proposed reality is, you have to claim that something is true, which you can't do without actually, which is a circular argument because you can't say your justification of correspondence is true because what, what your definition of true is relies on correspondence theory. So it's a circular question. Another theory of what truth might be is called coherence theory. It's a little bit, it's quite different. It's the idea that a belief is true if and only if it's coherent or logically consistent with an accepted set of other beliefs. So in this case, if I my belief that a fire truck is red is true because it's consistent with my other beliefs that fire trucks are a certain thing and red is caused by some, per, red is some kind of perception, visible perception. Um, Obviously, this is a very much more subjective idea of what truth is because anything, because if my ideas for what red are or what fire trucks are are different, then it could be true that fire trucks, 
or it could, it could be actually it could be false if my beliefs on those change that fire trucks are red. Um, maybe this seems a little bit weird to you, but there's an interesting actually um, application of kind of this idea of coherence theory, which is that a lot a lot of mathematics is built off of certain axioms, and the idea of an axiom in essence is that you can't really prove it. So any mathematics built from certain axioms are pretty much are pretty much in line with the idea of coherence theory. Math, certain mathematics like one plus one equals two is true because it agrees with axioms that we agree on, like um, perhaps the piano um, axioms or set theory as we know it. Um, and obviously this makes the argument that there isn't really such a thing as objective truth like we would have in correspondence theory. So what coherence theory's um, goal is probably to define what people generally accept as axioms or, or beliefs that they just accept as true. Um, so if you were to apply the coherence theory of truth to the Library of Babel, perhaps then finding a God book is not necessarily, or there's no God book that's necessarily tr true in its entirety. It has to depend on what your values are. And it can lead you to the same conclusion. Maybe your value is that like an index of the library is by default a good thing. If that's the case, then you still have the same result of trying to find such a God book. But coherence theory would force you to, I suppose, if you're looking for truth, evaluate what your core beliefs about truth are. And last one that we're gonna propose is the pragmatic theory, which is actually separate from pragmaticism, the, the um, linguistic thing we talked about earlier. It's basically the idea that belief is true, should be considered true if and only if it's useful to believe it, which is again, very relative and kind of denies the idea of objective truth. And one of the main criticisms of it is, is that usefulness seems to be more of an indicator of truth than actually defining truth in itself. But if you were to subscribe to the pragmatic theory of truth and apply it to the Library of Babel, what would probably happen is that you would be figuring out, okay, why is it useful for me to know about this God book and figuring out, I guess, what's the best path that's useful to your goals. Um, okay, it's kind of related to what um, Rupert touched on earlier, but it's the idea, um, the idea that you can interpret any random sequence set of characters pro properly with another set of, of random characters is actually related to this uh, crypto, um, cryptographic concept called one-time pads, which is basically you have 100 characters of what you want to send, and then you have 100 characters of key, and you basically mash them together, and then you end up with this encrypted message. And as long as you and the sender, I mean, you and whoever you're sending it to has the same key and no one else does, then it's pretty much 100% secure because there's no way you can differentiate between any, because the key, since the key is random, there's no way to figure out what the original message was. Um, there's also some uh, kind of independently related note, some religious real life um, ramifications or comparisons you can draw between a library of Babel and real and real life. Rupert, do you want to try to talk about it a little bit? Uh, sure, sure. So um, what what uh, one of the things um, Borges writes about is that in the library, there are different groups of people who um, try to interpret the library and find meaning in different ways. Um, and he has like the, a group that um, is just in the search for the one person who has read the index. And he also has um, the group that like thinks that all of these books are just meaningless and um, destroys them. So it, 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 um, it parallels uh, religion really, um, because I guess different people have different ideas about how to um, find truth in something that kind of might seem like disorganized. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, um, Jack, do you want to talk about uh, the internet? Sure. So um, this comparison has been made before, but some think that like because the internet supplies so much information, well, no, it supplies information, um, but not all of it is meaningful or useful or even true. So if you can sit, you can kind of compare having to sift through the library of Babel with having to sift through massive amounts of information 
that may be misinformation or disinformation on the internet. It's kind of a boomer mindset, I don't know, I know, but um, on a completely unrelated note, there's also an interactive of the um, version of the Library of Babel online, which is literally what you'd expect. It pretty much just generates really long random books. Um, but if you want to check it out, it exists. So, yeah. And uh, in, so um, the, way, the way it works actually is quite interesting in my opinion. Um, it uses uh, the same um, seed in a pseudo random number generator so that every time you input the same thing, you always get the same book back. And you can even search for text that you will find inside of books. So I think that's kind of interesting. Anyways, um, moving on, uh, there's, oh, Jack, did you want to say something? Oh, no, no. Okay. Um, moving on to uh, other like real life ramifications. Um, so Borges actually writes in a 1939 essay, um, which is called The Total Library. It's the precursor to this short story, which was published in uh, 1941. Um, but he, he writes about uh, Aristotle and Aristotle's metaphysics. And um, we're running a bit short on time here, so I'll try to keep this brief. But what Aristotle proposed was that all of um, nature was randomly created uh, and I guess fortunately created by atoms that differ in like their, uh, that differ in their contents kind of like letters. Um, and, and that all of, all of what we see is just a result of being lucky enough that those, I guess, letters came together to create something meaningful. Um, so uh, Cicero comes along and says in his De Natura Deorum, uh, which, which is this um, hilarious quote, uh, which you can read, but I will also read out. Um, he who believes this may as well believe that if a great quantity of one and 20 letters composed either of gold or any other matter were thrown upon the ground, they would fall into such order as legibly to form the annals of Aeneas. I doubt whether fortune could make a single verse of them. Um, which is, I guess, a contrarian viewpoint to the point of the library. Uh, but it is a valid, a valid um, point to make that searching for something meaningful inside the library is really hard to find. It's like searching for a needle inside of like a nearly infinite haystack. Um, so that's, uh, okay, yeah, um, we're running late. So I'll try to, um, I'll try to cut the short again. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, some scientists, knowing uh, scientists, actually um, put a keyboard inside of a cage of monkeys um, so they wanted to see like how, how feasible would it be that they would produce something meaningful. And I have a screenshot of that on the first, uh, on the next page. So um, this um, on the left is the first page of the uh, output of the monkeys, um, <laughs> which I mean, as you can see is, uh, it, it would take a very long time, a very long time to produce anything resembling words. Um, which I thought was a kind of funny, funny um, point to make. So maybe the uh, monkey on a typewriter analogy isn't feasible, um, but still uh, the random, the randomness of the library means that it could create words. I guess the monkeys were just sitting on an S or something. So I'll leave you with that. And I guess these are the there. topics that were discussed during this. Obviously, we're out of time, but take away what you will. We just present the ideas.